Okay, um, I'm happy to introduce our speaker today, uh, Yamila Miguel um, from Leiden Observatory. Um, so Yamila is a very versatile um, theorist in, in planets and planet formation. Um, she did her PhD work in Argentina, um, working mostly on core, core accretion models of planet formation of various aspects. And then she moved to a postdoctoral position uh, with our former colleague Lisa Kaltenegger at MPIA in Heidelberg where she switched to work on exoplanet atmospheres and chemistry. Um, and then most recently, she was in Nice, um, working with Tristan Guillaume and the Juno group, starting to work on planetary interior uh, work and equation of state problems. Um, she's going to talk about that today um, with some first results from the Juno mission in terms of the interior structure of, of the planet Jupiter. So please take it away. Thank you. So. Well, thanks the organizers for inviting me here, Sean. It's really a pleasure to be here today. And as Sean was saying, I'm going to be talking about the first results of the Juno mission and the very exciting things that we are learning about the interior of Jupiter. So let me start saying why studying giant planets is important. I think that most of us here really know that these planets are the first ones to form in a planetary system. So they form when there is still gas in the nebula, and that's why they have in their atmospheres and their interiors very key information, very valuable information to understand the formation of the planetary systems. So in the case of our solar system, and I like to show this picture because I know that there is a lot of exoplanet people here, uh, myself included, I was doing exoplanets before working with Jupiter, and it's really completely different to work with a planet that we can actually go outside and see, like Jupiter here. <laughs> so Jupiter is the best example of a giant planet that we have. It's the biggest one in our solar system. It's also the closest to the Earth. And it's most importantly, really, it was uh, very, very important in the formation of the solar system. It really influenced the dynamics of the smaller bodies of the system as well. So we really want to understand Jupiter better. We want to know more about the atmosphere. We want to know more about the interior of the planet. Because Jupiter is really the key to understand the formation of our own solar system. So that's why we want to know more about it. And even though we have really good data because there were some missions that went to Jupiter, many missions. We have really good observations from the Earth. But still, there are some key, very important information that we don't know. And some of it is, OK, what is Jupiter made of? And of course, we know it's mostly hydrogen and helium. But we don't know exactly the amount of heavy elements in the interior of the planet. And this is really key to understand the formation of Jupiter. And another one of those questions, and I'm putting here the ones that I'm particularly more interested in. Of course, there are many things that we don't know. But I want to know more about the heavy elements. And this includes the distribution of heavy elements in the interior of the planet. We don't know if everything is well mixed and Jupiter is homogeneous, or if it has a distinctive core in the interior. And again, this is key to understand the formation process and the evolution of the planet. So these are the things that I will be talking about today. And I hope to put some light on it. And of course, that's also why we sent Juno up there, because we wanted to know more about Jupiter, about the interior, about the atmosphere, the magnetic field, but the key things that we didn't know about Jupiter. So let me first say a few things of what we knew before Juno. And I really like this figure of Atreya et al. in a paper of 2016, where we have here different abundances of different elements, respect to the protosolar abundances. So if the elements are one, it would mean that they have the same abundance as the protosun. And here we have all the giants in our solar system. And you can see that we have a lot of information in the planets in our solar system, really a lot. Especially if you look at Jupiter, we have points in all of these elements, which is really amazing. And we have to thank the Galileo probe for this, 
because that probe entered in the atmosphere of Jupiter and gave us some very valuable measurements that we couldn't do any other way. So that's why we don't have so much information on the others, because we didn't have a probe that entered in the atmosphere like Jupiter. There is uh, one very curious thing. So first of all, all the giants are enriched compared to the protosun in heavy elements. Specifically, if we look at Jupiter, you will see here this point and here these other two points that are peculiar. This one is the depletion of water, but we think that the Galileo probe entered in a dry spot, and that's why it was unfortunate in a way because we cannot really trust in this water measurement. And for these ones, the question is, wait, helium and neon are noble gases. Why are they depleted with respect to the protosolar uh, abundances? And what we think that happens here is that helium has a phase transition in the interior of Jupiter. And then this, um, it forms droplets. These droplets capture neon inside and they rain down. So then we will have an overabundance of helium in the deeper interior of the planet and a depletion in the atmosphere that we can actually observe. And the same is observed in Saturn here. So the atmospheric abundances is one key element, but we have another very important element when we are studying the interior of planets, and that's, of course, the gravity field. So here um, I'm just going to explain some very few things just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. I know that you all studied this before, but maybe it's been a couple of years since you heard these things. So, Jupiter is a very fast rotator when we have a fluid that rotates so fast in less than 10 hours in the case of Jupiter. Then the gravitational potential can be written in this form here. And here, just pay attention on one thing that are these coefficients here, which are the gravitational moments. And they are very important for two things. One of them is that we can measure them. And the other thing is that they give us information of the density distribution in the interior of the planet. So this is really what we use to make our interior models. These are the observables that we use for the interior models because they, they directly relate with the distribution of the density inside the planet. Of course, we have infinite uh, gravitational moments. They are not all of them giving us the same information. So if we go to lower order, like J2, J4, J6, they are giving us more information on the interior of the planet. So here we have the core, here we have the atmosphere. So low order gravitational moments give us information more on the interior. When we go to higher and higher order, J8, J10, then we are actually probing more the atmosphere of the planet. And it's not giving us so much information of the interior itself. So we have that all the gravitational moments have really the two components. On the one hand, they depend on the interior itself of the planet, this component that we call static. is really like the rigid body, let's say. But they also have a dynamical component that has to do with the dynamics of the atmosphere of Jupiter, with the differential rotation. The low order ones really depend more on the internal structure, on this rigid body part. When we go to higher order, they depend more on the atmospheric dynamics. And this is really key because we are trying to understand better these two things. So it depends on which moment we are using, we are getting this different information. So this is just for you to have an idea of what we knew before Juno. And here I'm drawing J4 and J6. And this point here are the measurements we had using Pioneer and Voyager data. Here, this point is when we added Cassini data also. And this one is adding New Horizons. So this is what we had before Juno. We had information on J2, on J4, and on J6. And these are more or less the error bars that we had. So, with this information, we construct our interior models. And Jupiter looks more or less like this in the classical models. So we use all these, the abundances in the atmosphere, the gravitational moments, to build how the, how the, the heavy elements are distributed in the interior and to try to understand more 
uh, the amount of heavy elements and if the planet has a core or not. So before Juno, okay, so one thing is that um, these layers, here we have the atmosphere, like really this envelope, that is mostly molecular hydrogen and helium. Then we have this region here of the helium phase transition that I told you before. So in this other layer, we also have helium, but the abundance is different compared to the atmosphere. And also the hydrogen changes because we have higher pressures, higher temperatures. So then now we have a metallic uh, hydrogen in the interior. I also put a core, but as I was saying, we didn't know if Jupiter had a core or not. So depending on which models we were using, which equations of state we were using, it was possible to match the observational constraints we had using a no core at all, just distributing all the heavy elements in the envelope. But there were some other models where we needed to have a very big core. So it really depended on the parameters that we were using, but with both cases, we were able to match the observational constraints. So we realized that this was a pretty big, uh, pretty big range, and also on the heavy elements, they could be between zero and up to 40 Earth masses, which is also a very big range. So we knew that we had to do two things. On the one hand, to improve our models, and on the other hand, to get better observational constraints. And this is where Juno enters to play. So let's talk about Juno. Um, so Juno is not only doing gravity measurements, it's also doing atmospheric measurements and very good measurements on the gravity field of the planet as well. Today, I will be talking more about our results in the interior, but we are really getting very exciting results in all the other fields as well. And of course, since I'm talking about Juno, I have to show some pictures, and I know you will appreciate because they are truly, truly amazing. So this is a time lapse that was made with different pictures, sorry? Oh, so the spacecraft passes really close to Jupiter, about 4,000 kilometers above the clouds. And that's why we are having these amazing images. It passes very, very close. And so this is a time lapse. I think it's from uh, the sixth passage. We already had 10. And the cool thing is that I didn't mention this before, but one of the instruments in Juno, it's a camera that was not going to be there at the beginning what a big loss it would have been because these pictures are just amazing. And JunoCam is actually one of the, I think is the very first instrument that is on a spacecraft with purely outreach purposes. We cannot decide the pictures that are going to be taken, the public does. So they go to the website, they click on the images that they want to be taken and then they, are, they click, uh, there are many people voting and the ones that have more likes are the ones that are actually taken. So the only ones that they take every time are the ones of the polls. The other ones are decided by the public, which is really cool. There are like millions of people really voting before one of these passages. So I have here some of my favorites. This is very, uh, the ones I really like, but you can go to the website and pick the ones you like because they are very, very amazing pictures. These ones are really crazy. So it looks completely like a different Jupiter. This one's also of the turbulence of oh, the planet. They look really like, um, like art, <laughs> but they are really real images. So the people can download them, play around with the contrast, enhance the colors, but they are really, truly the photos of Jupiter. You can even see the cloud structures. It's really, really amazing. This is like my absolute favorite, the pole of Jupiter. It was not what I was expecting at all. So it's really, it's really great. You can see here all the different the turbulence that we have. It's really cool. And we also have images of this in the infrared that look really breathtaking. It's really incredible. So now going back to these questions that I promised you I was going to be talking about. Uh, the models that we do, we, uh, we take into account hydrostatic equilibrium, conservation of mass, energy, energy transport, but we don't do only one model. 
we really do thousands of calculations. So there are many parameters that we don't know. So we start the calculations assuming a set of parameters for the mass of the core, the helium in the atmosphere within the error bars that we have, uh, the amount of heavy elements in the atmosphere and also in the deeper layers. And then with our code, we calculate for these parameters, which is the radius and the gravitational moments that we get. And if these ones match the observations, we keep this as a potential solution for the interior of Jupiter. So we run these thousands and thousands of calculations, and that's, why, uh, that's how we get a space of solutions of possible configurations for the interior of Jupiter. So going back to this figure that I showed you before with J4 and J6 and the different measurements, the models that we are getting are here. So the blue area uh, is the region where all our models lay. They have these J4 and J6 parameters. These ones here, uh, the green ones, are results of Nadine Nettelman because we are not the only ones doing these interior calculations, of course. And these ones here are results from Burkhard Nilitzer and uh, Bill Hubbard. So we are all more or less on the same page regarding the J6. We do not agree so much in the J4. And the question was, of course, these models have a completely different uh, structure for the interior, completely different um, distribution of the heavy elements, completely different mass of heavy elements, core, no core. So which ones of these are actually correct? And if you see these points that we have here, they have large error bars. This one also, this one is completely off all the models. So we were wondering, okay, what's wrong here? Are the observations or are all the models, we are doing the right, uh, we are considering the, right par the wrong parameters? So that's where Juno came and really helped us for this, because this is the Juno point that we got after the first orbit. So with only one orbit of Juno, I'm saying it again, one orbit only, we got that point. And the error bars are really small. When we saw it, it was like, oh, wow, this is so great. And this is, of course, uh, we have like two independent teams doing these measurements, and they were discussing a lot about the error bars, which ones to put, which ones not, and they decided to put the larger ones that they could. So these are really the larger error bars we could put there. The one in J6 is even inside the dot. So it's really, really, really good measurement. And of course, this helped us with the models because then we knew where to focus. Okay, now we have to start understanding which are the models that actually fit this data with so incredible small error bars. So one key parameter, as I said at the beginning, is the equation of state. And this is something that we still don't know, I'm afraid, even for hydrogen, that is the, more, uh, the simplest element we have different equations of state, and they are giving different results. So here I split all our solutions in the two different equations of state that we were using. Both of them were published in the last years. These results here are when we are using the equation of state of Burkhard Militzer and Will Hubbard, and this one here are the results that we are getting when using the equation of state that they, uh, the Rostock team calculated in Germany. So the solutions are completely different. And this was very puzzling. Well, okay, with this equation of state, we could find solutions close to Juno, but we couldn't with this one. So then this was a very big question that we had, why we cannot find solutions with that equation of state. So we start looking at which are really the key parameters, what changes in all these uh, points, in all these different solutions. And after checking a lot, we found that the very key parameter besides the equation of state is the distribution of heavy elements in the interior. So when we have that Jupiter is completely homogeneous, that everything is well mixed in the interior, then we are close to here. This means this zero here, because this is the difference in heavy elements between the atmosphere and the interior. 
So if everything is well mixed, we are here, very far away from the measurements. But when we start separating this, when we started putting more heavy elements in the interior and less in the atmosphere, then we started getting closer and closer to Juno. So Jupiter is not homogeneous, as we thought. We really need to have a difference. We need to have more heavy elements in the interior of the planet. And then we start talking, we start working with this other equation of state because we wanted to know if it was not possible at all, if it was a problem of the equation of state or if it was a problem of the models that we were considering. And what we found is that if we have this classical model where we have a small core and these two layers, when we put more heavy elements here, we are actually getting closer and closer and closer to Juno. And we were able also to find solutions with this other equation of state, with this other model. So we are proposing these two models for the interior of Jupiter that actually match the observational constraints that we have so far. With this one, which is the classical model I showed you at the beginning, we have this layer of molecular hydrogen, of, deep, of helium that is depleted. We have this layer here of the helium rain. We have here a metallic hydrogen and helium. We have a core. And with this one, we are able to find solutions using this equation of state. When we are going to this other model, we are actually able to find solutions with both equation of state. So this is my favorite, but that doesn't mean that this is not possible as well and there is a problem with the calculations. But this other model, we have molecular hydrogen and helium. We have this region of helium rain. And here again, metallic hydrogen and helium. We have a core and we also have this region that we called diluted core. That is actually a region that has a lot of heavy elements, but they are mixed with the hydrogen and helium envelope. So these are the two models that are giving us good solutions to match the observational constraints. It's not possible to find solutions with no core at all. Jupiter is not homogeneous. We need to have more heavy elements in the interior of the planet. Now, of course, it's a matter of definition of what we call a core. So if, this, if all this thing is a core, including this part that is mixed with the envelope, or if we just call a core this distinctive part where we have only heavy elements, but really we need to have this core. We really need to have a larger amount of heavy elements in the interior of the planet. So this is really cool. Uh, now we know more about the interior of Jupiter. We know more and now we need to start asking other questions to understand the formation, of course, of the planet. And that's really what's next. So for the second part of my talk, I'm going to be talking about the rotation of the planet. And this is really, really exciting news. And I'm going to be showing results of three nature papers. So please don't post it on Twitter or Facebook because they are not published yet. They are accepted, but not published. So, so we've been observing uh, the atmosphere of Jupiter since decades. This is actually a movie shown by Cassini. And we know that Jupiter has these winds, these jet streams, but we don't know how deep they go into the planet. And this is really a question that matters a lot because all the models that I showed before are made assuming that the planet rotates as a rigid body. And if it happens that these winds go very deep into the interior, then there will be a lot of mass involved. And of course, they are going to have an effect on the gravitational moment. So then we will have to change our calculations. And that's why we started to wondering about this, about the circulation of the atmosphere, about how deep these winds uh, were going into the planet. So this is the same figure I showed before, J4, J6. These are all our calculations. This is the Juno measurement. And the question is, OK, all these models are made assuming a rigid body. And we found ones that fit Juno. But what happens if those winds go all the way to the center of the planet? How would this change? 
So then we did that calculation. And what we found is that the models in this area here can actually match Juno results if we consider differential rotation. For example, if we took these models here that clearly are not fitting the Juno point, well, if we take into account the differential rotation, then they might fit Juno as well. So for us, this works effectively as an increasing of the error bars, let's say, for our models. So, well, we said, okay, this is pretty big. We really need to, want to, to understand this better. We want to know exactly how deep these winds go, and then we will know more about uh, which interior models actually work for Jupiter. So then we started wondering the best way to do this. And as I said at the beginning, I hope you remember, uh, the J4 and J6 are actually giving us more information about the internal structure, not so much about the atmospheric dynamics. But if we go to higher order, then we will get better information on the dynamics of the atmosphere. And of course, before Juno, we didn't have information of J8 and J10, but now we do. So we did a similar figure, J4, J6, but we studied J8 and J6. And here, these, all these black ones are the measurements. And this one here is the Juno point. So none of our 20,000 simulations match the Juno point. And it didn't matter what we changed. We changed many, many different parameters. We increased the range that we were exploring. We changed the equations of state of hydrogen, of helium, of heavy elements. It didn't matter. There were no way of matching this point up there. So then we said, OK, this might be the, um, the differential rotation of the planet playing a role here. So then we did other simulations of the circulation of the atmosphere of Jupiter. And that's what's shown here with these uh, different squares. So just don't pay attention on all the different squares. If you are interested, we can talk more about it. But the different colors are actually different depths. So these colors here are if we assume that the winds are all the way to the center. And when we go here closer to the Juno point, the winds are getting more shallower and more shallower. So we are in the range of these blue points here. If we consider those blue points, we are able to match the Juno points. And then we look at J8 and J10. And here again, here are all our calculations. And this is the Juno point. So again, we were not able to match those constraints. And of course, because these J8 and J10 are more related to atmospheric dynamics. So we really need to consider that. So then what we did was to combine all our interior models with the atmospheric dynamic calculations. And we said, OK, which is the best depth for the winds for us to match the constraints of Juno? And this is what is shown here. So this is the likelihood of a match with all the Juno uh, gravity measurements. And this is the depth of the winds. And you can see here, this red curve here, is very showing us where do the, the winds need to be for us to match Juno constraints. And this is between 2,000 and 3,000 kilometers. So for the first time, we were able to actually say something about the depth of the winds of these, uh, uh, that we observe in the atmosphere of Jupiter. And they need to be of approximately 3,000 kilometers deep. So this doesn't end here. This is really exciting, because we seriously didn't need this for decades. It was a very long-standing question in planetary science. And the truth is that if we look here at these winds, there are other things that we noticed. And one of the things is that Jupiter is not really hemispherically symmetric. So we can see here these winds uh, that doesn't have a counterpart in the southern hemisphere. And if we put a map of all the magnitude of these winds, you can see it here. So we have this very strong uh, jet stream that is not in the south, and the opposite here. So we knew, of course, for a long time that Jupiter was not symmetrical, uh, in hemispherically symmetrical. But 
the question was, okay, how much mass is involved in these winds? Is it enough to show in the gravitational moments or not? And if you remember, I showed this at the beginning, talking about the influence of the different gravitational moments in the internal structure and the atmospheric dynamics, but I haven't mentioned uh, the odd gravity harmonics. The reason for this is because if the planet is actually and hemispherically symmetric, they are zero. And they never have been measured different from zero before. We knew that Jupiter was not symmetric, but since we never measured them, we thought, okay, maybe it happens that this, wins, uh, this is a very shallow uh, layer, so then it doesn't really show uh, the odd gravity harmonics. But the truth is that we have measured them now. So we have measurements of the odd gravity harmonics for the first time, which is super exciting. Uh, the reason why it's so exciting is because this is really giving us information on the atmospheric dynamics only, because this depends only on these winds. So we can truly say things about the dynamics in the atmosphere of Jupiter now, thanks to this. And here I'm showing the different gravitational harmonics and the values. Here is J2, J4, J6, J8, and J10. This dot line here is the uncertainty, three sigma from the uncertainty, and these are J3, J5, J7, and even J9 above the uncertainty. So we measure them for the first time, which is really, really cool. And, sorry? So this is the uncertainty here. For all, yes, yeah. And this is three sigma actually from the uncertainty. So just to be sure. <laughs> so we cannot really trust much in these ones, in J12 and J11, but we can in the other ones. So now I'm going to show you what can we do with this. So this is a study of the atmospheric dynamics. And what this is showing is the value of the different odd gravitational harmonics depending on how deep these winds go. So if the winds go not really deep, if this is a very shallow layer, then there is not going to be a lot of mass involved. And then the gravitational moments are going to be very close to zero, very small. If we go deeper and deeper into the atmosphere, then there will be much, much more mass involved and then the gravitational moments are going to be larger. So these are results of simulations, and here we have the measurements, which are these dashed lines here. And you can see that all the measurements intersect the, um, the, the models at the same area, which is, okay, I think, uh, wait, let me go back. So is this area here between 1,000 and 3,000 kilometers. So what this is showing us is that uh, these winds are as deep as between 1,000 and 3,000 kilometers according to the measurements of the odd gravity harmonics and the circulation models made in the atmosphere of Jupiter. And if we compare this now with what we obtain from the even harmonics, we get similar results. So this is really a strong result because from two different uh, independent calculations, we found the same things, that we need these winds to, to extend up to 3,000 kilometers approximately. And this is not really deep, right? The radius of Jupiter is the order of 70,000 kilometers. So it's not really a huge, it's still a shallow layer especially if you think from the interior model part. If you think from the atmospheric, you will say, oh, but this is huge, actually, 3,000 kilometers. So it really depends on the perspective. But this is saying that it's not so bad to, in to consider a rigid body when, including, when doing modeling of the interior of Jupiter. But we have to take this into account, of course, when we go to higher order gravitational moments. So, I'm going to leave here because I expect a lot of questions. And I'm going to say that really, we only have information of 10 passages of Juno so far. We have 32 to go, uh, not to go, sorry, 20 to go, 32 in total. 
So with only the first one, the very first one, we, are, we got incredibly good measurements. Now, with the information that we are getting now, it's so good that really the numerical methods need to be improved because we are getting larger error bars with the methods than the ones we are getting with Juno. So we are working a lot trying to improve the numerical method that we are using to calculate the gravitational moments and to do the measurements on the interior of the planet. This is definitely not over, but we are getting very close to understanding better the interior of Jupiter. So what we learn from this very first passage is that Jupiter is not homogeneous, is that we need to have a larger amount of heavy elements in the interior to match the observational constraints that we are getting. And this is really exciting. And we also have this model that we propose, this new model with a dilute core that now we have to see if it's so easy to form or not, if it's so easy to maintain uh, during the evolution of the planet or not. There are many, really a lot of questions about this that we are trying to solve. And of course, this is independently of the equation of state that we are using. And that's also really big because depending on which equation of state you are using, you are getting different results. But with all of them, we really need a larger amount of heavy elements in the interior to match the observations. And on the other hand, we are also making these new, very cool measurements on the winds in the atmosphere of how deep these winds go into the atmosphere. And independently, with the two, using the even J's and the odd J's, we are finding similar results that also go along with what we think happens with the magnetic field. So this is really, really cool and really exciting. And of course, I want to thank all the Juno team, especially here is all the interiors working group that I'm part of. And thank you for your attention. We think there was some systematic errors in those calculations. Uh, the thing is that those were not really published. So the only published ones were the ones of Voyager and Pioneer. The other ones uh, were calculated and were in the website of JPL, and everyone was using them, but they were not published. And when we got the Juno point, uh, we started uh, asking exactly that question. And then they found that there might be some systematics when they did those calculations. Yeah. Because it was even out of the error bars of the first one, so it was. I have a question about the equations of state. So, I mean, a conventional gas equation of state depends on density and temperature. But for a planetary equation of state, when you go deep enough, I understand that it's primarily just the density dependence that matters. So, <coughs> for what fraction of Jupiter's volume does the temperature actually have a significant impact on the equation of state? Yeah, it's, it's really, so one equation of state is more dense than the other. Mm -hmm. And that's why we can accommodate more heavy elements with one and not with the other. And that changes the, the internal structure. So it's really in the deeper layer. So it's not in the envelope. There we have really the same, uh, the same results. But when we go deeper, um, then we start having these discrepancies in the interior calculations. So it's more, let me think, um, it's definitely passing the, the, the megabar more like, yeah, it's passing the mega bar. So it's not the first layer, it's in the second one that we get the big differences. Yeah. Uh, can you describe the orbit of the spacecraft a little bit? Yeah, sure. So it's, uh, it's very um, eccentric. So it's passing close to Jupiter only for a couple of hours. And then the rest of the time is slowly going around. It lasts 52 days, approximately. So, um, and it passes in the, in the closest point, it passes above 4,000 kilometers above the clouds. And it enters into one pole and leaves on the other. So that's actually what, it, what is good for the gravity measurements. This uh, special orbit was designed for that. And at the beginning, we were going to have a different orbit. So the idea was to have, so this mission was going to last only for um, a bit more than two years because the orbit was going to be every two weeks. 
but the thing is that when the, that orbit was going to be reached in two parts, uh, first we were going to put it in this orbit that it is now, mm -hmm. that is almost two, two months, and then we were going to change the orbit, the final one. But when we did the first correction, they, um, everything went to safe mode, and we didn't know what happened if there was really an error. Uh, apparently there was no error, of all, the, all the instruments are working fine, but we didn't know if to do the other one and maybe risk uh, that it was going to, to blow up or something. So we had a lot of discussions and then we decided to leave it with this orbit of 52 days. So the mission is going to last uh, the same 32 orbits and we are going to do the same science, but it's just going to last longer. So, And you know, if um, if I think of the rush that we had this year, trying to match all these observations, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> Question? Yeah. Are there any implications for Saturn and its structure, or is it di mass different enough that you can't do that, or composition? Mm, so, yes and no. So, we are, uh, after this, uh, the PI of the mission was actually talking with the people of Cassini, and kind of put the idea of doing this uh, grand finale of Cassini. And what it did is they changed the orbit, and it had at the end a similar orbit than Juno to do better gravity measurements for Saturn as well. And now they have those measurements, and we are using similar models to also try to match Saturn. So I'm also playing with Saturn interior. But um, yeah, but Saturn is really different from Jupiter. That's what I learned in the last months. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really different. It has much more heavy elements. It has a larger core. Uh, this layer, this uh, this layer here, might be much more deeper, like the, the winds. So then they will have a larger effect on the gravitational moments. So what what my experience so far tells me is that when you go to smaller objects, they are much more complicated. <laughs> About the color scheme of some of those outreach images? The, sorry? The color scheme? Are they false color or true color? Oh, they are true colors. Mm -hmm. If you are asking me uh, why, why those colors, we don't have an answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> but they, um, so some of them are enhanced, but it's truly true images. You can go to the website and download the, the, the raw images and play around. Can you uh, gather any? information on the composition of the core? So that's a very tricky question so, and, and a very big one that we are wondering. Because the truth is, if, if we have problems with the equation of state of hydrogen, you can imagine that we have many for the equation of state of the heavy elements. So, so far we are using rocks and ices, uh, but it would be great to know if actually at those pressures and temperatures, those elements are really soluble with hydrogen and helium, and we can actually have this dilute core that we are proposing, because we don't know yet uh, that. So there are many open questions regarding the core, and definitely we don't have an answer on the composition yet. So it sounds like every pass you can measure some of the gravity modes. Um, so I was wondering, are they constant in time, or do you notice any changes? So we have um, the thing, we measure them all, but when you have more and more information, you improve your accuracy. So at the beginning, we had that dot that I showed. If you see the point now, it's just a point. You don't even see the error bars because it's getting better and better. But it didn't change, so that's good. Um, but we are getting really all of them. It's not that in one passage we get J2 and in the other we get J4. We get all of them and then we improve the accuracy. I don't think we are going to get much higher order, but, um, but we improve what we have so far. What can you say about the latitudinal dependence of the zonal flow? Ah, well, I'm not really doing those calculations, so that's more the people working with the atmospheric team, so I cannot say much about it. Really, but there is like a whole atmospheric team working with that, exactly that, trying to, to say more <coughs> things and, and describe better the dynamics of the atmosphere. Yeah, but I really have no answers for that. And 
it really doesn't matter much for the interior calculations. It matters how deep this differential rotation goes. The balcony. Oh. Had a question? Yeah. I did. Um, so a couple of months ago, I learned about a concept called uh, uh, magnetic shadowing how the, the core, if it's not part of the dynamo, basically gives you a, a void at the poles. What are your friends on the magnetometer team telling you about the distribution of the uh, magnetic field, mm. where the dynamo exists, and how that bears on you know, the size of the core and, and, and uh, where there might be a, a, a kind of void there? So I'm not really the expert on the magnetic fields, and I definitely cannot say you much about the core, but I've been hearing and talking with them a lot about what happens with these winds. And what they are uh, calculating is this, uh, the conductivity, how it increases in the interior of the planet. And if you see how when it increases suddenly, it's actually at least 3,000 kilometers. So we definitely think that there is a magnetic effect where the magnetic drag kicks and really stops this differential rotation. So we think that really the magnetic fields are key to understand the depth of these winds. But I'm not uh, really sure about, uh, I cannot tell you anything about the core right now because I haven't been looking at it. I will, thank you. Okay, quick, an easy one. Do you know when the nature papers are coming out? Oh, they are coming at the beginning of March. Thank you. Any other questions? Another one? Up here, yes. Um, is it possible there's some density structure in the core that's, that's causing some of the power in J3? So it's so small that it, I don't think it really would have any, such a big effect. I mean, it's big, it's a couple of Earth masses, but still compared to all the mass of Jupiter, it's really nothing to have an effect on the gravitational moments. Especially the gravitational moments, only really J2 goes all the way to the interior. The others are really going much farther out. So they are not really, the core is not really affecting that much the gravitational moments. It would be great to have um, measurements of uh, oscillations in the planet to, to actually know more about the core itself. <laughs> um, why is it that there's, there was no information from Galileo? Uh, this the probe? Yes. The, oh, on the gravitational moment? Yes. You mean? So, yes, yes. So, we had. But it was not really, I mean, the, the ones that we, the, the other ones were really the more telling. So, Galileo was really big on um, showing us the abundances of the atmosphere. But for uh, having gravity measurements, what we do is to send a signal from the Earth, and then the spacecraft catches the signal and sends this back. So you need to have these gravity instruments there to have those measurements. Hi, Phil. This is really fascinating. But um, at the WF, I saw a, a similar talk about the, the Juno mission by, was it Scott Bolton? And he showed these like cyclones at the poles. So, is there any are those connected to the winds, or do they extend as deep down as these? these um... I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know how deep they go. So, this is really like the whole thing. It's not really like independent spots. Okay. I'm not even sure I can ask a question about the red spot. So it's more like, okay, all the winds globally go more or less up to 3,000 kilometers, but each independent spot, I'm not really sure how deep they go. Are we going to be able to observe that, or uh, will the more independent spots tell you more about yeah, independent spots? And so I know that the, the, the team is working with the great, great red spot right mm -hmm. now to, to get better idea of how deep it goes, on uh, yeah, on how much mass in mass mass involves, but so yes, yes, they are, we are definitely going to get more information. But there is so much data. Like if you see the images, you have these huge storms everywhere. So it's really difficult to to spot uh, individual things. But I know that there are a lot of people trying to understand that right now. Anyone else? Okay, let's thank you, Mila again.